So we're now in we well, as far as the discussion goes, as far as this tutorial is concerned, we're now discussing the week nine topic, and tomorrow we're discussing the week 10 topic, although we're actually officially in week 11. So we're quite close to finishing the term. So the last week will be next week, which is week 12. And we'll finish, well, we'll do week 11. We'll discuss week 11, the week 11 topic on Thursday of next week, and perhaps I'll schedule another weekly tutorial just to do the revision. Oh, and, you know, we'll see how it goes. So we're talking about wetness, very unreasonableness today. Now, before we start talking about this topic, was there anything you wanted to raise? Questions you might have? None? So we could begin. So um, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain unreasonableness, illogicality, and irrationality as grounds of judicial review and the requirements to establish unreasonableness as a ground of judicial review. Now, before I proceed, I'd like to know, if I speak this way, and I'm not really you know, speaking loudly, are you able to hear me well enough with this kind of voice? Okay, that's good, so I don't really have to strain my voice. Okay, so we could begin. Now, before we start talking about the, um, the discussion questions, I'd like us to just see, you know, how we understand unreasonableness. Uh, not so much that I'd like you to then, I mean, I'm not going to provide the answer at this point. It's something that you will uh, go back to before the end of the session. But just to see if we end up having an improvement in our understanding of uh, the notion of unreasonableness by comparing uh, how we understand the concept as of this time as compared to when we finish this topic, the tutorial session. So uh, what I'd like you to do then is to type in the chat box uh, your answer uh, to this question. What is your underst understanding of the meaning of unreasonableness as a common law and statutory ground of judicial review? And if you could, uh, it will even, even be better if you could perhaps provide an example. Okay, and um, yeah, I'll have a look, I'll have a look at your, the chat box as soon as you start writing something. But I can't see the chat box though. It's going on. Ah, okay, I got it. Oh, Janet is here. Is Janet there? Oh, okay. Oh, Janet, I didn't realize you were there. Oh, Janet, um, I, I just wanted yes. to tell you, yes, I just wanted to tell you that I've seen the, uh, the email concerning the um, review, your request to have your legal memorandum reviewed. I will do that, um, if not today, tomorrow, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So at this point, what we need to do, what I'm asking you to do is to give your understanding of the meaning of unreasonableness. And if you could uh, provide an example, perhaps. And then, you know, we will proceed with uh, discussing the problem questions without, at this point, actually going deep into the concept of unreasonable yet, uh, unreasonableness yet. All I want to do is to just see, you know, what your understanding is at this time, and then compare it later on before we end the tutorial session. Mm. Okay. Um, could anyone possibly give an example? Aha. Uh -huh. Nice, Josh. Nice. Mm, very good. Uh, how, how about the others? Can you provide an example? And then we'll start discussing the discussion questions, if you could. Too subjective, the rationality. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're gonna have to kind of look at 
how our unreasonableness can be distinguished, if it could, from the notion of irrationality as well. Okay, so before we proceed with the discussion questions, perhaps the question I'd also like to ask is, so we've, you know, you've, a lot of you have stated that uh, it should be unreasonable, uh, like from, the, from Josh, what would be expected of an ordinary person acting in their capacity within that body or authority. So when we say that it's unreasonable, so, so that you know, no sensible person or authority can arrive at that decision, who do we refer to here? Whose reasonableness is that? Is that the man on the street? Do we do a poll? Is it that of the decision maker? Is it that of the uh, applicant? Is it that of the court? It's, it's, of the, it's, of the, it's of the person acting in that capacity because if the person is an expert, for example, they their, their rationality for making the decision will be hard to challenge uh, as opposed to uh, a common decision maker in an ordinary office, so to speak, if you're going to put it that way. So it's reasonableness from the viewpoint of the decision maker, not the courts? Yes. Not the court? Not the courts. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to that. Thank you, Josh. So let's begin by talking. So as I said, we were not going to go deep yet into, the, into that specific question. We will go, come back to it before the end of the session. Or we will actually be able to answer that question uh, during the course of the tutorial. But I don't want to uh, jump into a discussion of that without going first to the discussion questions. Um, would anyone wish to read problem 26 for us? So we could begin. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Patrick. Community Exchange, a senior manager of the Department of Social Services, was fired from his job after the DSS investigative panel found him to have committed sexual harassment against Jill Lockworth, his subordinate. <laughs> the disciplinary proceedings against Mr James have been based on the Public Sector Ethical Standards Act, which prohibits sexual harassment. Mr James asserts that the penalty of dismissal that was imposed is totally unreasonable and irrational considering that he had been in government service for more than 20 years, had always had silly point of views and was at no time subject of any disciplinary action or investigation. Given that it was open to the DSSIP to impose a penalty such as suspension, it was totally unreasonable and irrational for it to have imposed a penalty of dismissal. Advise Mr James whether the decision met the weaponry unreasonable standard of judicial review. Okay, thank you, uh, Patrick. Can I ask everyone to post? Uh, here's your answer in the chat box. And I'm transferring your answers in the, on the screen because as far as Zoom is concerned, the chats are not actually recorded. So I'm just gonna transfer them there. So these are the answers of the students. So that would be from the second answer would be from Josh. Patrick, do you have your answer there? Ah. The decision is not unreasonable. So meaning the decision is reasonable. Okay. Okay. 
So um, from here, um, Janet, the one about actual bias by the decision maker, is that your answer to problem 26 or does that relate to the previous question that I posed? Hang on, um, I'll just get my little chat one up that I put up. It has to have probative value by the decision maker based on the evidence. It is not unreasonable or necessary, necessarily irrational. Minister for Immigration versus okay. SZNDS. So, th so this one about the That's actual bias is not uh, an attempt to respond to problem 26. It's not. Uh, the probative value one. I, I'm talking yes, about the bias here because he posted something else in the chat. Oh, that that was that was to the one before. Ah, okay, okay, yep. Just just to be clear. Yep. So I think the th of the four. Okay, fr from the viewpoint of Matt, Matt. So in your case, does it mean that um, you? Th is it your point of view that the decision was unreasonable, or that seems to be the way I read it? So it is unreasonable for you. Okay. And for the others, it is not unreasonable, meaning it is reasonable. No. Oh. Huh? No, oh. I actually, based on the, uh, the probative value by the decision, if, if it has yeah. probative value by the decision maker, based on the evidence, it is not unreasonable or necessarily irrational. So what's your answer there? Is this re unreasonable? It is not unreasonable or not necessarily rational. So it is reasonable for you, Janet? Yes. Yes. So the only, would, it, would it be correct for me to say that the only one who is saying here that the decision is unreasonable would be Matt? So Matt, you were saying that it is unreasonable, correct? Yes, I, I was. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Now, uh, would anyone care to explain uh, his or her answer? I can if you like. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, um, unless, unless it's a really serious offence, um, there are other avenues um, that would be, instead of dismissing straight up, there's training, suspension, um, fines, and, uh, for someone to, to have their first um, uh, infringement in that work uh, of that nature, they, they, um, it can be remedied. And um, uh, for them, to, with the fairness or, or fairness to people who are working, if they make a mistake or they do something stupid, they shouldn't just be sacked straight up. There's avenues, um, other avenues to deal with it. Whether the uh, judicial review would be successful or not, that would be a matter for the um, for that application. But uh, uh, under these circumstances, um, I, with the information available, I would apply for the judicial review. Okay. In relation to that, Matt, and I'll ask your um, classmates later on to give their views. Do you, do you suppose it's possible for somebody to actually disagree with your viewpoint? Like right now, we've got three of your classmates disagreeing with you. How does that yes. mm -hmm. so yeah, Yes, I do. But... Yeah. Um, with in the Penalties and Sentences Act, um, uh, when we're dealing with people criminally, um, they're always given uh, you know, first offences. They're, they're given the, low, the very lowest penalty. The information in, in this case here is that um, uh, sterling performance reviews and no disciplinary action or investigation. Uh, it, it appears he's of good character, except for this um, uh, indiscretion. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I talk? Yes. Go ahead, Josh. Um, I would. I would say that it is fully within the power of this board, of this panel. Sorry, to dismiss him with the full penalty, especially a crime of this nature, sexual harassment in a social services environment. Um, in any case, actually, sexual harassment is quite taken quite seriously, as is most crimes, but particularly this one, I feel like the uh, slap on the wrist is within their power, but it's also within their power to issue the full maximum sentence. And one of the um, things that resonate with me was a comment in one of the cases 
saying that Wensbury unreasonable ground is confined to extreme cases involving demonstrably absurd decisions. So I feel like it, this is, it would not be absurd for a man to get fired for having um, alleged sexual harassment proven against him. Okay. I'm just going to uh, make things a bit more confusing. I'm going to muddy the waters a bit. What if the crime or the offense uh, for which Jay Cornelius was charged with pertained to his alleged theft of a piece of ball pen? And same facts, everything is the same. Everything is exactly the same, except that this time the offense is the theft of a ball pen worth, uh, how much is that? Three dollars. And so he's been there for 20 years. Yep. And uh, the, uh, the penalty was still dismissal. What do you think? I think that would be unreasonable. <laughs> hmm. How about the others? Uh, Patrick, Matt, Janet? Seems excessive. <laughs> uh-huh. What I'm not sure of was under Section 52D of the ADJR, yeah. there was a discretionary exercise of power in bad faith. If we're looking at bad faith, does that apply to the penalty? It applies to the decision, not the penalty itself. The penalty is yes. part of the decision. It's not so much the penalty we're looking at. What we're looking at is the decision. Okay. Oh, right. Uh, Patrick, a bit unreasonable. Okay. Before we, we, before we start looking for the answers, I'm just going to uh, muddy the waters further, make things a bit more confusing. What if, what if um, the Public Sector Ethical Standards Act provides that the penalty for any offense in the public sector uh, would be dismissal. And so as a consequence, um, the penalty that was imposed was dismissal, even for the offense, of, the alleged offense of having stolen a bullpen worth $3. Wasn't there a case where there was something really excessive? Oh, that was it, Edelston, where the penalty, it was stated that it was basically an, <sighs> stepping outside of their powers to make something so, make a decision so detrimental. I think they were going, trying to get 100% of the Medicare um, funds sent to the taxation office mm. and there was something that said that it was no no other reasonable decision maker would have come to that that you can't actually deprive a person of their income or their living uh, and make it a punishment okay very good um so let's proceed first to the because there were now three things that we discussed the regional facts, and then we added the thing about the offense now being um, the theft of a bullpen worth $2. And the third one was the fact that the law was changed so that the penalty was going to be uh, dismissal regardless of the nature of the offense. So let's go back to the first one. So can somebody just sum up for us what is likely the answer to the original facts of the case based on problem 26? Uh, I, rec I believe that it would not be, the decision does not meet our Wensbury unreasonableness. Because? Because the decision is not, is, the decision is within the power of the panel to make and would not be considered absurd or unreasonable according to their facts and all, things like that. Okay. So that would be correct. That would be the correct answer. The, if you follow the rule on the principal 
principle enunciated in um, the Wednesbury case, the statement of uh, Green, MR, was that the decision to be unreasonable must be such that no sensible person or authority could arrive at such a decision. Whereas in this case, uh, it is open to the DSSIP to find um, that the proper penalty was going to be uh, dismissal, then it's difficult to claim witness very unreasonableness. The point that this should be clarified there, or that should be emphasized, is that the standard for unreasonableness can be said to be quite high in the sense that it's, it's almost as if everyone has to be in agreement that this is the only potential decision that could be arrived at. But whereas it's open for you know, decision makers to debate or to disagree on what the proper decision should be, then it's difficult to claim uh, when it's very unreasonableness. Okay, now, so we're clear about that. The answer is, uh, it would not meet the uh, witness very standard of judicial review. Now, so I changed the facts and then I made the offense at the theft of a ballpen worth $3. And um, Janet uh, gave a very good answer. So Janet, can you just uh, summarize for us or restate for us what you think is the answer to that question? Assuming the facts are exactly the same, exactly for the, but the offense this time involves the yeah, $3 I'm ballpen. I'm just trying to have a look for the case because I wrote my notes down here. You're um, correct in the case that you cited. Ed, yeah, Edelston versus Wilcox. Yes. And, and I think it was, nor was such a facility for the collection of tax intended as a means for the infliction of punishment upon a taxpayer. And the relevant part of the Act was not to penalise the taxpayer's conduct or to abolish his business. The exercise of the power. Um, was so unreasonable that no reasonable person could have exercised the power. It didn't mean that they couldn't have put a penalty in. Mm. It was just that the penalty of uh, substitute notices relating to 100% of the amount of the payments, that was what was so unreasonable. Very good. That's why I asked about the penalty before. <laughs> now, would it matter, though, because in this case we're talking of uh, Mr. James having been there for 20 years. What if he's only been there for six months? What Personally, do I, I don't feel like that changes the um, severity or the punishment for the crime in, that, in this context. But would you agree that it would be open actually for the, to the decision maker to decide that the appropriate penalty would be uh, termination anyway, even if the amount was $3 because, according to them, it's necessary to set a, a high standard of honesty and ethics among public servants. Or would you say that it's absurd for them to uh, arrive at a decision that termination is the appropriate penalty, notwithstanding the offense seemingly being minor? I think... Perhaps it would depend on the environment of the workplace right. because if the workplace had a very, like there was an implied feeling of relaxed, like a relaxed environment where every, where someone might feel like they could, it was a little bit more give and take, mm -hmm. then perhaps it would be unreasonable because the person might feel surprised. Whereas if it was an environment that was very rigid in its, in all sorts of different ways, then that could influence the way that people make decisions in that environment. And so, so I, little, little things could become bigger. Yeah. So Josh, are you saying that depending on the work environment, it may actually be possible to recognize the reasonableness of a decision of a decision maker to terminate an employee despite the offense being merely the theft of a ballpen worth $3. Yes, I believe so. Especially if it was expressed that they expected a very, very high standard and that 
everything in the office was supposed to be looked after properly and that it, everything was accounted for and et cetera, et cetera, the list could go on. If they were very, very, if that was laid out very strictly and perhaps even intimidately, like I believe some workplaces could be with these things, mm. then I would not be surprised if um, they just gave you the goodbye in that context. Yeah. Now, what does that suggest to you? If on the one hand you were saying it seems to be unreasonable and yet you're saying that it could be reasonable depending on the work environment. It depends on the evidence presented. Let's assume that the evidence is quite clear. The person is guilty of um, having stolen a bullpen worth $3. That has not, you know, that is not under dispute. The only question is the reasonableness of the decision. So what does it suggest to you if on the one hand, Josh was saying it's unreasonable and yet he's also saying, depending on the work environment, it might be reasonable. What does it tell us? It is flexible. Sorry, so, you go. Would it be the... Would it, would In each case, it's heard on yeah. its own merits and its own evidence, and therefore no two cases are alike. So the decision maker has to take into account the facts and the evidence that are presented. So it could be the type of work environment and the standard that is expected. Right. And up here. But this brings us to the, to the crux of the matter. Given the fact that, you know, it's possible, depending on the work environment, to terminate the person or not, would that meet the standard of wetness very unreasonableness? Or is there a distinction between wetness very unreasonableness and unreasonableness as a popular concept? When I say popular concept, you know, the way we understand it, the layman's understanding. It's unreasonable according to the popular concept concept of unreasonable in, in context of the Wednesbury principle there's got to be there's got to be more than just unreasonable according yes. to popular belief and it is up to the decision maker again based on all the evidence and the facts to make their decision and to put the penalty in good so okay. Very good. Thank you, Janet. So in that, in, in, in the, under the changed facts, where the offense now involves the theft of a bullpen worth $3, which is not disputed and it's been proven. And um, yeah, so that, that's the fact. And the fact also being that Mr. James this time has only been there for six months. Since it's open, actually, for a decision maker to decide that the appropriate penalty was uh, termination, it's difficult for, for uh, those factual circumstances to meet the standard of witness very unreasonableness. So when we speak of witness very unreasonableness, it's not the popular idea of what unreasonable means. It might be unreasonable to us, but that's, a, that, that's not the, the, the legal point. The legal point is, does it meet the standard of witness very and reasonableness. And when you speak of witness very and reasonableness, we're always looking at, uh, from the viewpoint of a sensible decision maker, can it be said that it is not open for him or her to arrive at any other decision? So if the only decision that the decision maker can arrive at, at is this specific decision and yet, that decision maker, in, in other words, if it were open to the decision maker to arrive at multiple decisions and he, he exercised his power to arrive at a specific decision, it will not meet the standards of Wednesbury and reasonableness. Okay, was that, was that clear enough? Now, the other question that I raised then was what if the law says that... Um, Regardless of the nature of the offense, the penalty would be dismissal. Does that make any difference? That takes in a very broad range of offenses from something extremely minimalistic to something criminal. Okay. I think that's too open. So what's the answer there? 
What's your answer there, Janet? An amendment. <laughs> so it the, needs to be right and changing the facts. It, it would be an abuse of power for something so tiny, so small that it could be insignificant. Okay, so I was changing the facts this time. We're now looking at the law providing that regardless of the nature of the offense, the penalty was going to be dismissal. And so does that make any difference to the discussion that we've had? What are the views of the others? Um, I'm kind of leaning towards the view that if Parliament put in place an act that prescribed such a stringent requirement, then that is the way it is. Um, because the executive, it's fully within their power to make laws like that. Um, and I had a point that I've lost, I was going to make in regards to that. But it's kind of like, into, and it's a controversial, perhaps for me to say this, but like some people would say that some of the things in the criminal code today, in, under current uh uh, under current culture, would are uh, irrational um, certain criminal provisions in there, and they would say that that they shouldn't be in there because it's just not reasonable to expect it of people. But that doesn't matter because the criminal code says it's a crime, so therefore it is. So I feel like there's a lot of it's arguable that you could say that, that they can make a stringent thing because ignorance of the law doesn't excuse you from being applied like under the law. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing we need to remember is that if you speak of administrative law, what exactly is administrative law all about? What is administrative law concerned with? The decision makers of the uh, executive. Right. It's not criminal law. Everyone here is gravitating towards criminal law and we're out of scope. So it's about exec executive decision, excesses of the actions of the executive. So when the, when the question involves the legality, validity or constitutionality of a law, does that belong to uh, administrative law? The answer is no. And it also means that judicial review is not the appropriate legal remedy. Okay, so if what is involved is a question of the constitutionality or validity of a law, therefore, the, uh, the body that is being taken into account or be, is being questioned is, that, is the legislature. And because it is the legislature, it, it, it isn't within the ambit of administrative law, which focuses on the decisions and actions of the executive. That brings us to constitutional law in that case. And because it brings us to constitutional law, this isn't really much of a question of uh, judicial review in the sense that of you know, a common law judicial review or uh, uh, an attempt to apply under the ADJR Act. Because the ADJR Act are concerned only with uh, questions uh, based on decisions of the executive. So if you're impugning the law itself, you're gonna have to go to the high court and look at section 75, for example, of the constitution, and it becomes a constitutional law question, not administrative law. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Patrick, perhaps you could read a question for us. Uh, yes. After finishing a diploma of community services work at the Goodness Good Technical Institute, Sherlock Gordon applied for a social support workers license with the Australian Department of Social Services. The Social Support Workers Act requires anyone seeking to practice as a social support worker to obtain a license from the DSS 
anti-meat requirements as immoral fitness. Gordon submitted all the requirements, including a police clearance, that stated that he has no criminal record of any conviction. The DSS, however, received an anonymous call saying that Gordon had been the subject of a police investigation for child molestation. That investigation had even been covered in the news at that time. Because of the unwillingness of any witnesses to come forward, the investigation has subsequently been terminated. Gordon was later informed by the DSS that it had concerns about his moral fitness because of the complaint against him for child molestation in 2005 and hence could not issue him a social support worker's licence. He has come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise Gordon on whether he can apply for judicial review on the ground that the DSS decision was unreasonable. Thank you. Can I ask you to, uh, everyone to post uh, your answers in the chat box? So we've got a, a point here raised by Janet. What constitutes moral fitness? From Ali. And this would be, oops. This would be from Matt. Do we have your answer, Josh and Patrick? I mean, you don't want you don't have to answer right now if you don't want to. Um, Patrick, would it mean yes, as in it is unreasonable? Ah, the decision was not unreasonable. Okay, so this is from Patrick. Okay, we have some disagreement here. So Matt is saying, um, it does not meet the standards of witness very and reasonableness. The answer of Patrick it is, is that it is, it's also that it is reasonable. But uh, the, the answer of Josh is that it is unreasonable. And then Janet is raising the point what constitutes moral fitness? What, what does that tell us, Janet? If, it, if we have a question of what constitutes moral fitness, what does, it, what does that tell us? I guess that's my question. What does it mean, moral fitness? From a question of law, if this scenario came up, and as a solicitor, I would advise Gordon to apply for a judicial review because there's nothing in that scenario that says to me that he hasn't met the requirements as per the scenario. The only twisting factor is what is moral fitness? How, do, how is that defined and how is it demonstrated? Okay. From the viewpoint of administrative law, the fact that there is no definition of moral fitness, what does that tell us? I believe that would mean that moral fitness is up to the decision maker to assess based on all the things that he has viewed as evidence and therefore, some of that could be. Therefore what? Uh, therefore, therefore it's up to his discretion. Okay, but I mean from the viewpoint of judicial review, what is the implication of that? It's not a question of law. 
right. It is not a question of law. So as far as judicial review is concerned, it is of a very limited scope, very limited and narrow scope. Judicial review only seeks to look at or examine the legality or lawfulness of decisions. Therefore, if there is no definition, it can only mean two things. One, it's probably a factual question. It doesn't involve a question of law. So therefore, judicial review is uh, inappropriate. Or two, if there is no definition, it can probably mean that it gives the decision maker sufficient discretion to define what it means. And again, that takes it away from judicial review. Okay, was that clear? Now, um, setting that aside for now, setting that aside, that, 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 that issue aside, um, we've got, you know, uh, a divided court here. Two are saying the decision is uh, reasonable, meaning it does not meet the standards of witness, theory, and reasonableness. We've got two others saying it, it, it meets the standard of witness, theory, and reasonableness. So what's the correct answer here? Going back to the issue of why would, as far as those who feel that this meets the standard of witness, very unreasonableness, what is your basis for saying that? So there are two of you who said that it meets the standard of witness, very unreasonableness. That would be Josh and... Um, what was the other one? What would you be? What would be your basis for saying that this meets the standard of witness, very unreasonableness? No, I I think that the decision is completely reasonable. Ah. So you're changing your answer. Uh. Initially said that the decision was not reasonable. Sorry. I think I may have uh, mistyped that and meant to say the decision was not unreasonable. Ah, okay, good, good. So you're all in agreement that this is. It does not meet the standards of witness, very unreasonableness. You're all in agreement. Why would you say that? Where's the evidence? Yeah, the police, uh, it was a police investigation, but they didn't file any charges. It was, in fact, terminated. Yeah, Matt? That doesn't, when they terminate the investigation, it may be a, um, a finding that they don't have enough to um, proceed. It doesn't mean they're innocent, but with respect to this decision that was made, another decision maker, if there was another decision maker apart from this one, they could have come to the same conclusion, taking into account the investigation, which I think is relevant, and there, there could have been two of them making the same decision. So it's, you know, but another, another person could have discarded it completely. So I don't think it's a, a matter for um, JR. Mm. Good. So, <clears throat> Matt, Matt I, 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 I'm not, if, you know, I, if I might, I might be wrong. Were you, were you the one with the police background? Or was that Paul? No, it's me. Oh, was I'm, I a senior sergeant. I'm a senior sergeant oh, and a prosecutor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I should remember that. <laughs> okay. <I'm happy. laughs> okay. Uh, are you with the Queensland Police? <laughs> yes. It's I'm always, sergeant. Okay. It's always to be uh, important to be in the good graces of the police. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. problem. Okay, good, good, good. So um yeah, um the answer is it does not meet the the you know the um the standard of witness very unreasonableness. 
because it, it's clearly open to the uh, decision makers to arrive at the decision that there was evidence uh, of uh, moral unfitness. So as pointed out by Matt, even if the investigation was terminated, it doesn't mean there was no evidence. It, the evidence was just not sufficient to support a criminal prosecution or even a criminal conviction, but it doesn't mean there was no evidence at all. Now, what if the only evidence was an anonymous call and nothing else? What if the only evidence was an anonymous call and nothing else? Would it make a difference? Yes, it would. Yes, Secondhand yeah. hearsay, under the rules of evidence, it holds a lot less weight. There is nothing else to back it up. But there's still weight. As far as... Uh, and the decision the maker has got the onus of um, weighting the probative value of the evidence before it. Yes. So, so they may consider it, but because it's not backed up with anything, they may put lesser weight on it. Right. But we agree that even you know hearsay evidence or even double hearsay evidence uh, can be given probably value by uh, decision makers. Are we in agreement with that? Yes. Yes. So. Hello, Andrew. Yes. <coughs> Who's this, Ali? Uh, it's Ali speaking here, but actually. Manjo, we have to give a consideration to other facts being put, uh, being put to the executive. I mean, this is actually a, just an anonymous call, but mm -hmm. the other criteria that Gordon did fulfill, I mean, the anonymous call, like, uh, like she said, it doesn't have any property value, but the other criteria that Gordon did fulfill, it meets the requirements, but the argument comes down to on this uh, circumstantial evidence. Mm. So it doesn't really it, it doesn't really put any weight on evidence that Gordon have any uh, uh, like unfit personality. It's just like some hearsay rule, really. So what's our so what's can, the answer there? Can can the executive on on this evidence come up with a reasonable answer? I think no, because the uh, Mr. Gordon met his requirements, and uh, under uh, under the evidence rule. You have to be proven guilty before you actually, you know, the mere fact that this somebody isn't, is... This isn't a criminal proceeding. This is a decision uh, made by the Australian Department of Social Services. That's correct. But actually, the executive has to take in consideration irrelevant, irrelevant matters. Otherwise... So, w w would, can it be said that the uh, decision maker... Would be uh, would would meet the standard of having committed witness value and reasonableness by by giving probative weight or giving weight to an, an anonymous call and on that basis making the decision not to grant the uh, license to Mr. Gordon. Mr. That's Gordon. exactly what. That's exactly the point. Can the executive on this anonymous call make a final decision? The, 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 I mean, the, the, the evidence on our hand at the moment is not actually a probative evidence. That's what I'm trying to say. So, Janet, that would be witness very reasonable. How about the others? Yes. I feel, I think that the, because it is reserved to the discretion of the decision maker, if they decided to take that evidence and place weight on it that persuaded them to reject the applicant. I do not see how that would be unreasonable because I feel like more than one person in that role would make that same decision and therefore it would not be a excessive use. It would not be an exercise of power that is so unreasonable that no reasonable person could have so exercised the power. I would tend to agree with Josh on that point. It's up to the decision maker to uh, determine uh, the weight of any evidence. It's up to them to, deter to attach probative value to any available evidence. That is still evidence, even, it's, even if it seems to be secondhand. We may say, argue that it, un it is unreasonable from a sense of moral justice, but that is not what we mean when we speak of witness, very unreasonableness. It has to meet that legal standard. 
I, I have something else here that might be useful for yes. Ali. Um, I didn't source it, but it's a quote from your notes. It says, it must be proved to be unreasonable in the sense that the court considers it to be a decision that no reasonable body could have come to. It is not what the court considers unreasonable. Uh, that's a different thing altogether. So I think what Ali's bringing up is something that perhaps the court might consider unreasonable, but a decision maker, well, that's a different matter completely. That's right. So going back to the question I initially posed at the start of the tutorial, whose decision uh, are we testing whether or not it meets the standard of witness very unreasonableness? As uh, pointed out and answered correctly by Josh, it is the decision maker's decision, not that of the judge. So it is not the viewpoint of the judge on what constitutes uh, reasonable or not. It is that of the decision maker that we're looking at, that we're examining. Because as uh, the case in uh, the Witness Perry Corporation case uh, pointed out, if you leave it to the judges, you know, each judge could actually arrive at his own idea or notion of what seems to be reasonable or unreasonable for that matter. So we'll look at and examine the, uh, the decision of the decision maker, the original decision maker. Hello, Manjo. Yes, Ali, is that you? Actually, I just, want, I just want to say that it's a very thin line between a judicial review, if we come to a matter of unreasonableness, mm -hmm. a very thin line between a judicial review and a, and a tribunal review. In this matter, we're just like trying to see if we can I get Mr. Gordon to a judicial review, but by saying what you said, that actually the first point is to actually to see an, inter an internal review after all. I mean, that's more, more actually, more uh, better than actually chasing up uh, a, a judicial review. That's actually the point. I would, I would approach it differently. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look at whether or not this is appropriate for a judicial review or an administrative review on the basis of the evidence. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hinge the choice or the remedy on the nature of the evidence. The, the question for judicial review is whether or not the decision is lawful or not. That's a question. It's never about the, you know, it's never a question of uh, whether or not the facts are correct or whether there is a preferable or correct decision. That belongs to administrative review. And so therefore, if you want to know whether um, administrative review is available, we always have to go back to that basic question of whether or not the law on which the uh, administrative decision was made provides for administrative review by the, the, by the um, administrative appeals tribunal. That's the basic question. If it does not, then outright, administrative review is unavailable. So in other words, Administrative review of administrative decisions is not available in all circumstances. The law on which a, an administrative decision has been made must specifically provide that a review can be made uh, by the administrative appeals tribunal. So that's the basic question. That's the basic uh, step that first needs to be hurdled. Now, if that is unavailable, then you begin to ask, since I can't go and have an, you know, I can't appeal to the AAT. Uh, hold on. What we also have to remember is that if you want to have a decision reviewed, it doesn't mean that you need to go straight away to the AAT. You can always ask for an internal review process. So go to the, um, the general manager or the head of the department or even the secretary of the Department of Social Services to possibly review your case that is still part of the administrative law process, although it, it's not the formal uh, administrative law review through the AAT, but that's still part of the review process of administrative decisions. So in other words, if the, uh, if the law on which the administrative decision was made does not provide for an avenue for merits review with the AAT, it doesn't stop you from seeking a merits review by appealing to the, uh, the manager or the head of the department. That's still available. That's always available. Now, if, if you know that the law does not provide for merits review, 
and you know that it's uh, it's unlikely to be worth your time to bring it to the attention of the head of the department because uh, you you know that the head of the department is likely to just rubber stamp the decision of the original decision maker. So therefore, you are left with the question of do do I have a right to possibly bring this before the courts on the basis of a judicial review? And that's when you begin to determine whether can common law review, judicial review be available, or can I uh, have this reviewed by the courts on the basis of the ADJR Act? Spe especially in this case, you begin to wonder whether uh, you want to raise the issue of witness very unreasonableness. So it's not so much a question of evidence, it's really more of a question of uh, what if you're able to meet the jurisdictional requirements. That's the first thing you need to be clear about. But can you, mind you, can you actually, uh, what I was looking at at the beginning, that Mr. Gordon, let's say somebody doesn't like him in the community, let, let's say that, yes. and upon, upon the decision of the executive that he received an anonymous call and he yes. made an ultimate decision on those evidence, like, yes. uh, like, uh, uh, like our learned friend said, she, yes. she points a good point, that the executive should take a reasonable decision. That's what I'm saying between a thin line between a judicial review and a tribunal review, that a court will actually look, does, did the executive on evidence took a reasonable steps to figure it out? Because a person, I mean, like, this, this is the way I looked at it. Like, if somebody else in the community, let's say, didn't like the person, will the evidence have any weight on it? Okay. Uh, you're right to an extent, uh, in the sense that it's possible for the courts to look at the evidence because obviously, if there is no evidence to support the decision, then um, it will be most likely for the courts to say that there is a jurisdictional error involved or um, that the decision might actually be unlawful on the, on the basis that there is no evidence to support the decision. But uh, as to the question of the probative value, is it is not for the courts to actually determine whether the, the decision maker was correct in weighing the probative value of evidence. It is not for the courts to do that. That is uh, only available to a merits review, to an administrative tribunal. Courts cannot examine uh, whether the uh, decision maker was correct in evaluating the decision on the basis of evidence. That solely is for a uh, merits review, not for judicial review. In other words, judicial review is of a very limited scope and of a very, for a very na na narrow purpose, especially in the context of evidence. So if there is no evidence, then likely it's possible for uh, judicial review to be available. But as I said, in this case, as pointed out by Josh, there is evidence. There is an anonymous call and it is up to the decision maker to uh, give weight or not to the, uh, to the anonymous call. And if the decision maker decides to put some weight, even if it seems to be hearsay evidence or even double hearsay, it will not be, it, the courts do not have any power to uh, correct the uh, decision of the decision maker in that regard. Manjo, can I ask you a question, please? Oh, yeah. Janet, yes. In regard to this, when I look at these scenarios, the first thing that flashes up to me is this is employment law. Why would one go through looking at, if, if there was an enactment to go through the AAT for a merits review, yes, that would be the course to go. But if there was nothing else, that to me would be employment law and there's plenty of laws and plenty of cases that would mark this down as something that could be challenged in a court of law. I understand what you're saying about the judicial review and, and I still have a level of confusion, if you like, between that and a court of law. All but... Right. Um, yep. okay. Let me begin by saying I'm not familiar with... Um, employment law. So I'm not really sure if we really speak of reviews of employment law decisions, if the decisions are actually evaluated by courts, meaning chapter three courts, or by yeah. administrative tribunals. If I understand things correctly, it is most likely the case that uh, employment, 
agencies are tribunals, not chapter three courts. Yes. So because they are not chapter three courts, they are administrative tribunals. Again, we go back to that basic question that because they are tribunals, they actually are in a position to examine the uh, property value that a decision maker makes, as opposed to if it were a chapter three courts, where the chapter three court will say, we cannot uh, acquire jurisdiction over this because it doesn't involve a question of law. It involves a question of fact. I understand this for the administration law. I guess my point is when I looked at the scenario, I'd think, why even go down that path? Why not go straight to employment law and look at how you could challenge it? Possibly. Sorry if it's taking you too far off track. Uh, right, but as I said, I'm not really sure uh, what the answer to that because I'm not familiar with employment law. What we need to remember, though, is that this is a uh, public sector uh, matter, and it's a Commonwealth public sector matter, and I would therefore assume that it may not fall within the power of uh, uh, the employment tribunal to look at this, which I assume will actually examine uh, decision uh, termination decisions from the from the uh, field of the from from the field of the private sector, not the public sector. I could be wrong. But as I said, you know, I'm, I, I don't know much about employment law in Australia. So we could just leave it at that. Okay, but you're right. I mean, if it's available, why not? Okay. Now, it's 7.07. .07. I actually prepared another set of questions just for tonight. And I don't know if you wanted to go through this or we should call it a night because it's 7.07. .07. What do you think? Personally, I've got uh, other matters that I was hoping to get done tonight. So. Yeah. so we'll just call it a night. Okay. So good. I think we were able to um, answer the uh, question of what we meant by witness very reasonableness. So um, what does the other say? Would you like to call it a night or do we proceed? I'm happy to do a bit more if there's anybody else to, or if you're just prepared to go through a few things with me, Manjo. Who else uh, might be willing to stay on? I mean, I'm happy to push to go. It's not, not a problem in case he needs to do something else. Now, I'm okay. happy to go, Manjo. Are uh, you happy to go on or you want to happy to leave? No, no, I'm happy to go on. Ah, okay, okay, go. Okay, good, good. How about you, Patrick? Are you still there? Yeah, absolutely. I'd, uh, I'll stay on if we're going to stay on, but I'd like to go off and do. I need to do some other things. So, so um, why, why, why don't we get this done in about five minutes, if it's possible? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, anyone who wants to leave, you're free to leave. And thank you for joining us tonight. Um, after the twenty third of October. Uh, hold on. Let me just. Uh, uh, Patrick, I think you may have to mute your mic. Patrick, yeah, I'm not really. Patrick, can I ask you to read the question, the problem for us? <coughs> yes. Jill, Gillian, and Scott Harmon took the plumbers' licensing tests to secure a licensing certificate under the Queensland Licensing Regulations Act. Queensland, under the Act, examinees of the plumbers' licensing test must sit for the test under secure and invigilated conditions to avoid any cheating. The Act provides that no drinks and food are followed in the test room. Are allowed? Sorry. It also provided that toilet breaks shall only be permitted if there are at least two invigilators who are present, one of whom must accompany an examinee to the restroom. During the test, Jill, who was suffering from diabetes, requested that he be permitted to take some food because his sugar levels had dropped considerably and he was in danger of collapsing. The invigilator refused the request, citing the act. All right. Scott also requested Scott also requested for a toilet break because he was busting. But the invigilator refused because there was no other invigilator who could accompany Scott to the restroom as required by the Act. When the test results came out, both Jill and Scott failed the exams. They had come to you as a solicitor for advice on whether they had a legal ground to appeal the results of the test on the basis of the unreasonableness of the invigilator and all the law. Okay, what do you think is the answer? 
Um, can we just say whether it's uh, when it meets the standard of wetness, berry, and reasonableness or not? In the chat box. No, I don't think. What do you think? Uh, no. So, what does no again mean? No means. Um, uh, so, on whether they have a legal ground. So, no, they do not have a legal ground. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so Patrick, no, it doesn't meet the standard. Okay, good. So, at least we know the answer now. It's you know, what the, what the invigilators did seemed very unreasonable, seemed very oppressive in fact, but still that does not meet the standard of witness very unreasonableness because it was open to the decision maker, to the invigilator to decide one way or the other based on the law. If you have a problem with the law, it's a constitutional law question, not an administrative law decision. Because here there was basis, there was a power uh, on which the uh, invigilator could make a decision to say no to the request for a toilet break or for food. Okay, so I guess that's it for us tonight. Any questions before we go? None? So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I hope to see you tomorrow. We're having a makeup tutorial tomorrow at 6 o'clock to look at the week 9 topic. Okay? So thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Manjo. Thanks, Sergeant Matt. I hope to see you someday. <laughs> <laughs>